three. Now before we start, this is going to be a bit of a two-part uh, module. We're going to get two separate lectures. This part of the module is going to deal with the information that you read in chapter four. You should have also read the May case, which I posted a link of right before this, this, uh, this lecture. So once again, class, make sure you've read chapter four and make sure you've read the May case. Now, you may notice, looking around, that, well, I'm not in Eddy County, I'm not in Lee County, I'm not even in New Mexico. I'm currently filming this lecture from Guatemala City. Now, we are in the tiny country of Guatemala for this lecture and for this purpose because it connects very much to the May case, which you should have just read. Now, the May case is a very interesting case that deals with the subject that we're covering this week, and that is arbitration. Now, you have seen in the lecture that we talked about mediation, negotiation, arbitration. This case, the May case, deals specifically with arbitration, and it's a great uh, backdrop for this material and a great way to break down exactly what arbitration is. So, what is arbitration? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the May case and why we're talking about it. First of all, the May case is a pretty obscure case. I picked this case because it, uh, it it's, it's a great on point when it talks about arbitration, but it's not a more particularly famous case. Uh, it's also pretty easy to break down, even though it's it's over 125 years old. It's it's a very easy case to understand uh, the the information provided. So let me just break it down for you a little bit more. Now, in the May case, you saw that a, an American citizen named Robert H. May came to Guatemala. He was hired by the government of Guatemala to run the Guatemalan Northern Railway. Railway. He was to be paid a whopping $35,000 a month for this job, and it was a one-year contract. Now, I'm gonna be frank, uh, class, I don't really understand the details of the contract. That's a lot of money for, that's a lot of money for today, let alone in 1898, but from the best I can understand, the way it worked was that in 1898, that $35,000 covered all of the expenses necessary to run uh, the railroad operations. So he was gonna take that money, he was gonna use it to run the railroad. He was also supposed to uh, paint a train station at Puerto Barrios. He was, uh, he was supposed to use that for operation of the railroad. And then whatever was left over, I'm assuming he was supposed to keep. Well, Mr. May uh, was hired by the government of Guatemala and shortly thereafter, things started to go south. Now, uh, Mr. May's response, ultimately his claim, was that Guatemala was not paying me the money they promised me, and I couldn't even properly operate the railroad with the money they sent me. There was some evidence that they sent $20,000 uh, one month, which uh, after missing some, some payments previously, so he was having difficulty uh, making payments. Uh, after several months, though, this uh, go governor of Guatemala, for all intents and purposes, fired him. They said, we're done, you're, you're gone. Mr. May felt he was owed a certain amount of money. He had a contract, and he felt he kept his end up. The government of Guatemala countered and said, you know what, you actually are indebted to us. You owe us money. And the problem is, neither side could really reach an agreement. It got to the point where the United States government got involved and the US government was trying to negotiate on behalf of the parties. And it became ultimately a, a conflict, if you will, or a dispute, I should say, not a conflict, but a dispute between the government of the United States and the government of Guatemala. Now, in a court of law, this could be decided in a court of law, but there was a dispute as to which court it should end up in. Uh, Mr. May felt a little, shall we say, a little bit concerned about the possibility of filming, or excuse me, a possibility of having his case heard in a Guatemalan court. The Guatemalan government, of course, said, hey, everything occurred in Guatemala. We don't think we should have to go to the United States and have this decided. So what they did is they settled upon an arbitrator. So both sides had a dispute as to how to settle this this uh, this dispute. Or both both uh, the United States government and the Guatemalan government and Mr. May all had their disagreements as to how this should be resolved. Uh, Guatemala was the country of uh, where this all took place. This all occurred in Guatemala. The contract was with the Guatemalan government, and we talked about standing. We talked about uh, minimum contacts and all that. Guatemala had. Guatemala was where it was located, but Mr. May and the United States were a little bit, a little bit, shall we say, concerned about having the case heard by the Guatemalan courts when one of the uh, parties was the Guatemalan government. So what they ended up doing was they settled on arbitration. And when I say arbitration, what they did is they had a gentleman named 
Britt Jenner, who was the general counsel for the United Kingdom in Guatemala. And basically, he was the ambassador, if you will, for the uh, for, for the United Kingdom. Well, he was British, and he agreed to arbitrate the matter. So, what is arbitration again? Well, we read that in the book. Arbitration is when you have a third party, oftentimes it's like a retired judge or something like that, uh, or an attorney who hears the the evidence in the case and he makes a ruling based on the law. And his ruling is final. It is not appealable. Remember how that's different from negotiation, where you have the attorneys talking with each other. Remember how that's different from from mediation, where you have like an attorney trying to mediate with both sides, saying, "Hey, will you take 75?" No. Okay, you you'll take 60. Let me see if the other side will accept 60. Then, and they go back and forth and try and work something out. An arbitrator is sort of like a judge, and in this instance, the British ambassador was the judge on this case. Now, again, he heard the evidence in this case. He states in his opinion, he found that some of Guatemala's accusations against Mr. May were a little over the top. They've accused him of just about everything, and, and the ambassador, Mr. Jenner, basically said, I don't know about that, but he still considered it. He heard the evidence, and he eventually reached his decision, and his decision was not appealable by Guatemala, because Guatemala ultimately lost. He basically uh, sided with Mr. Mr. May. Let's go take a look inside the museum here. There's not much of a train system left in Guatemala. I would have loved to film this lecture on a train. But this museum here, this train museum, Guatemala City Train Museum, looks like an interesting thing, and we might learn a little bit about Guatemala and train history, and maybe they even have something about Mr. May in there. Let's go to inside and take a look. Well, class, we're going into the Guatemalan uh, City Railway Museum right now, and we've already bought tickets, so I'm not going to stop and buy tickets, but as we're walking in here, you can see this was an old railway station. This is where passengers in Guatemala City would come in, they'd wait, they'd take the train, We've got some original vintage trains here, which is is a neat thing. These are not operational, as far as I can tell, but they the they they are they've been redone and and they're in very good condition. This is a really neat experience here, and this is a really neat setup. You know, for an old museum, they did really well with this. And we see the waiting area, the video talking about the history of this museum. And this museum, again, uh, was built in 1884. They got some original posters there that would have been hanging up in this in this railway station back in the day. They got a lot of neat exhibits here, too. And you can see this area here has got a lot of original or reproduced uh, signage that would have we would have seen in the railway station. And then we've got this, which, all right, I don't know what this has got to do with trains. and. I'm going to be honest, this is a little bit of a gut punch. This is like a 70s record player that I would have seen in my house. So, you know, that's always a little bit of a gut punch when you see something from your childhood in a museum. But but whatever, uh, I digress. So here's a passenger car, and we're going to take a look inside uh, that in a second. But we're also going to see some of the, the sleeping areas uh, for the employees, uh, the train employees, and the, uh, the transportation trains that would have not been taking passengers, but would have been taking cargo. And in Central America, there would have been a lot of uh, a lot of like fruit and, and grains and what and whatnot you know uh, of course uh, bananas were a big export for guatemala at the time as was coffee which is still a big export uh this would have been a where the employees were would have been been staying and and they did a pretty good job of recreating this uh this this cabin as an employee cabin and uh we can see this is probably the dining room here and this looks like this would have been the sleeping cabin for one of the railway employees and and uh yeah, that suitcase is from the 70s. So again, another gut punch here. Uh, it's going to happen to you guys. One day you're going to be looking at a museum that's 125 years old and see a suitcase from your childhood in there. But that's neither here nor there. So let's take a look in this railway cabin and uh, the passenger uh, train. And again, you know, this is this is what Robert May was hired to, to run. You know, he was going to be running this, this rail, railway across Guatemala. And Guatemala is not a big country, but... You can understand when you travel this country it's very mountainous uh there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh thick vegetation thick thick uh thick forests and, and jungles up in the north it the railway would have been a very important means of transportation for for guatemalans Go. well class we're here inside the guatemalan city railway museum it's a really neat little museum if you're here in guatemala a lot of people come here for Tikal, they come here to go to Antigua, but you know, this is definitely worth a, worth a, a visit if you're in Guatemala City, if you've got a little time to kill. Uh, I had, you know, the time to kill and this is a great place to film this lecture as mentioned. But again, we're inside what used to be the railway station for Guatemala City. 
It was built in 1884, 14 years before Robert May was hired by the government of Guatemala to run the Northern Guatemalan Railway. Now again, there was that dispute, and we talked about that outside. As we can see here, the Guatemalan Railway uh, Railroad was a very important part of transportation in Guatemala, both of goods and of people. And at this point, the Guatemalan Railroad is not really an important part of Guatemala's uh, transportation, if you will. A lot is being done by trucks. Uh, people don't usually use the trains anymore. I don't even know if there's any passenger lines left in Guatemala, to be honest. Uh, I will also add that Guatemala hasn't had the best of luck with their railway system. Uh, if you were to look at arbitration Guatemala Railroad, you're going to see that there's another case involving uh, a, an American company involved in arbitration, international arbitration, over a railway deal that went south. And that one is much more recent. I think that's about 20 years ago. But let's go back to that May case. Remember, we're talking about the difference between arbitration, mediation, and negotiation. What's interesting about this is there was no mediation whatsoever, but there was a fair amount of negotiation before we got to the point where they had to call the British ambassador. Now, this is also another interesting thing. This is a little bit of history. You're not going to be tested on this, but Britain, Britain's relationship with Guatemala and with the United States at the time wasn't necessarily rosy. I'm not saying Britain was an enemy of both countries, but uh, keep in mind, the United States and Britain had somewhat rough relationship, especially in the 1860s. There was an incident called the Trent Affair in which the United Kingdom almost went to war with the United States in the middle of the Civil War because the United States government uh, entered a ship and removed some Confederate diplomats off of a British ship flying the British flag. This angered Britain so much that they almost declared war on the United States. The Trent Affair happened in 1861 and by the 1890s relations were getting better, but it wasn't until uh, it was Early on in the 1890s, about 1895, uh, that an incident or a, a development called the Great Rapprochement occurred. And what that basically means is that was a point in 1895 where relations between uh, the United Kingdom and the United States started to get better. But Guatemala and the United Kingdom didn't have the best of relations uh, as well. There was a border dispute. Now, what is now a country called Belize used to be called British Honduras, and Guatemala had a claim to British Honduras. So Britain, in many ways, was the perfect arbitrator because they were going to show favoritism because they didn't really have a great relationship with either side. So it was a good arbitrator, and I think that's why both Guatemala and the United States asked the ambassador, or asked the general counsel, uh, Mr. George uh, G.H. Uh, Brett Jenner, uh, George Harris, I think it was George Harris Brett Jenner, who's the ambassador, to be the arbitrator. And again, they were negotiating. At one point, there was a, the government of the United States was closing in on a settlement, but Mr. May didn't like that settlement. Uh, at one point, as part of a, uh, a settlement offer, uh, as part of the negotiation process, the, uh, the country, Guatemala, offered him about $31,000 in bank, uh, not $31,000, but the issue there was that these, this $31,000 was to be paid in $100 bills issued by Occidente Bank, a bank in Guatemala. And as Mr. Jenner noted in his arbitration finding, uh, that those $100 uh, bills, that $31,000, had depreciated quite a bit. Uh, quite a bit. And what that basically means is, uh, in, in layman's term, uh, that money was, was worthless. It was the bank didn't have enough to back up that money, I'm guessing. I don't really know. But Whatever the case is, the arbitrator recognized that $31,000 issued by that particular bank, the Occidente Bank, uh, did not, was not worth $31,000. It was $31,000 in name only. So that compromise offer wasn't going anywhere. So the United States and Guatemala, they were negotiating. They were trying to reach a settlement. Mr. May, at one point, rejected the offer. So they agreed to go to arbitration. And as I mentioned outside, Guatemala, maybe they overplayed their hand because they accused Mr. May of everything bad under the sun, from everything from being a rabble rouser who, who led a, a, a labor strike to a smuggler to a uh, to a conspire uh, an anarchist who's conspiring to blow up the, the trains to uh, a serial killer. I mean, they they, they threw everything under uh, every accusation under under the un, in the book against them. They probably even accused them of hating hating kittens and puppies too. But whatever the case is, it probably hurt their case because the arbitrator was looking at this and saying, you know what, 
this seems awful far-fetched. This seems like way over the top. But at the end of the day, arbitrator looked at the information and he said, Guatemala, you're in the wrong. You owe Mr. May this money. You signed a contract and you owe him the money. Now, can Guatemala appeal that? Can they go to the court and say, you know, Judge, this arbitrator was completely wrong? No, they can't. That's the point of arbitration. That's the beauty and the curse of arbitration. When you have an arbitrator, their decision is final. So when you sign, uh, sometimes you sign contracts, like for example with a, your phone contract, when you sign AT&T or Verizon, there's probably a clause in there, and there's almost certainly a clause with a credit card, that a mandatory arbitration clause, because these companies like arbitration. They like arbitration because it gets settled right away, and you don't have any appeal, it's not going to get dragged out in the courts, their decision is final. The arbitrator hears the evidence just like a judge, and when they render a decision, that decision is final. Well, class, I'm going to wander around a little bit more here in this uh, railway museum, and then we're going to go to Guatemala City somewhere to grab a bite to eat. We'll talk a little bit more about Chapter 4, and again, if you haven't read Chapter 4 yet, and you're at the end of this lecture, well, you got a good idea of what we're talking about in Chapter 4, but you really need to read Chapter 4. And then we're going to read Chapter 5, and we're going to have another lecture in another beautiful location talking about some of the issues in Chapter 5 in this module, Module 3. Thanks, class. We'll catch you at the next lecture.